good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's good to see all the little kids this morning. You know, some, some people get a little nervous. They say, does that distract you? I love them. I'd have them all sit up here if I've had my way. <laughs> what a blessed remembrance that Jesus Christ came and died for our sins, that he gave all for us. Shouldn't we give all for him? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here, that you have saved us, that you've made us new. You've given us a heart and a mind that is toward you instead of against you. That our fleshly minds that were completely against you have been changed. That you sent your Holy Spirit into us to guide us and to lead us into all wisdom, to remind us of everything you've said. We thank you for your word which has been left meticulously so that we might study it and unfold the wonder of who you are. I pray that you help each one of us, Lord, wherever our mind is, whatever condition of our heart, that you would receive us based upon the grace of your son, Jesus Christ. And that you might help us as we go through the word that it would transform us and make us more like you. So Lord, pour out your spirit on us and help us to love you in this way. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're, we're back in the book of Genesis in chapter 27. Um, it's interesting because I've been through uh, Genesis before, but it seems the more I go into it, uh, the more that I see. Have you found that to be the case? Oh, yeah. It's just layers and layers. You can just drill and find more and more things, which I think is great. So we've been looking at the life of Abraham and all of the, his trials and difficulties. And of course, the culmination is in chapter 22, where he is asked by God to come and sacrifice his son, which is incredible because he's 100 years old and finally has this son of promise that God promised 25 years earlier. And he's been waiting and trying to figure it out and doing some other things. And now God asks him to take him up onto a mountain and to sacrifice him, and he does. And at the very moment where he's about to execute fully God's plan, God stops him. Because it was all designed to be a picture of God bringing his only son and allowing him to die on that same mountain thousands of years later. So we see God has an intention beyond sometimes what we see in the story he has something else prophetic for us to see. And a lot of scripture is that way. We see something on the surface and then we see something down beneath. So we've been looking at Abraham. Of course, Sarah dies. Eventually she gives it up and she gets buried in a tomb uh, that he buys. And, and the whole thing of buying that property, which is still in existence today. And you can visit it if you go to the Holy Land. It's actually in Hebron. So she finally dies and he buries her. We saw Isaac going and getting a wife. Actually, the father gets a bride for Isaac. Abraham says, listen, before I'm done here, I've got to find a good girl for my boy. That's a, that's a worthy project right there. Good luck to all of you who are parents doing that. But I can tell you this, pray for them. Pray for your kids. Pray for those that they might marry someday. Pray that God protects them and holds them and develops them. And so... The whole thing about Rachel, or I'm sorry, Rebecca, I always do that. And about how Isaac takes her into Sarah's tent, and we saw the picture of what that means. That the, every, everything about Christianity that we have is based upon the foundation of the Old Testament and how that's kind of the tent of Sarah. So we've talked about that. We see that Abraham rolls forward with his life after the death of his wife. We don't know how long, but he marries another woman called Keturah. And he has other children. In fact, he has six. The dude is old. And he has six kids. None of you are amazed. I'm amazed. Because the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable and God fixed him real good. We looked at Abraham's family and how that all went down with Isaac and how, re how his wife gets pregnant and then suddenly uh, she's got 
twins in her womb after 25 years of waiting. And she says, listen, if this is of God, why is this so difficult? Did you ever wonder? Lord, I'm a pastor. You called me here. How is this so difficult? It's supposed to be easy. Oh, you guys never question those things. But she says, why? And she goes to the Lord and prays. And he says, because there's two nations in your womb. It's a little crowded. You've got twins. And they're gonna, you're going to give birth to them. And they're going to be two different nations. And they're very different. We see them born. We see Esau comes out first, all red and hairy. And we call him Harry because that's his name. That's what Esau means. And then Jacob comes out holding his heel. And so they both get names because of what happened in that birthing room. They, they probably would have called me loud. I don't know. Abnormally large. You know, it could have been anything. There are better ways to name kids, but this is how they get named. This week, we're going to dive into some sojourning. We're going to follow Isaac as he goes through some things. Uh, it, it's like reading a story, maybe a, a, a section of time in your life when you've been through. I imagine there are very few people here that have only had one job. How many, I wonder, have only had one job? Well, that's awesome. Well, then you don't know the difficulty of cha having to change jobs. <laughs> How many of you lived in the same place? Lived in the same place. Amazing. Well, then maybe you don't relate to the story. But anyway, <laughs> there's a lot of moving and there's sojourning. And it's interesting. The scripture tells us that we're sojourners. A sojourner is somebody that's just not staying. It's like, you know, everybody at the Red Roof Inn, they're all sojourners. They're going from somewhere to someplace else, and that's where they're camped for the evening or maybe a couple of days. We're sojourners, and that's what we are. This isn't our home, you realize. So we're just passing through. It begins here in chapter 26 that there was a famine in the land besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. So don't be confused. It's not the same famine. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gerar. Does this sound familiar? This is exactly what Abraham did. Abraham did this, act, and if you read the stories, I could put them before you if we were doing some uh, sort of a Bible college thing and show you all the similarities. It's, it's dead on. Isn't it amazing how your kids do things like you? None of you have that happening. That's amazing because uh, I've noticed in my children, they both have attributes of my wife and they both have attributes of me. Sometimes good, sometimes not so good. Uh, pray for me. But this is, this is where he went. He's, he's getting out of here. He, he buried Abraham, and he's on his way out because there's a famine. Nobody wants to hang around when there's a famine. Uh, I can think of worse things, like, like having Murphy for a governor. But th they're leaving. I'm sorry, it just came to mind. Hebron. He's leaving pro the promised land, and he's headed toward Egypt. Egypt is always a picture of what? It's a picture of the world. It's a picture of the flesh. It's a, it's a picture of a place you don't want to go. Uh, wherever it is that you came from, whatever slime God pulled you out of, that's basically what that represents. And so typically what happens is everybody goes to Egypt when it gets hard because you've got the Nile Delta and you've got lots of things that still grow. And even though you don't have a lot of water, you do have some water because you have the Nile there. So everybody says, well, I'm going to do the easy thing. I'm going to go to South Carolina. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm going to go to Egypt. <laughs> Sorry, or Florida, fill in the blank. So he's, he's on his way and he's headed right toward Egypt. It's like deja vu because they're, it's the same thing. So when the, the going got tough, Isaac ran in the same direction as his father did under the same situation. Do any of you have a bad temper? I wonder. Let me just see your hands so I can be forewarned. Okay. I have a bad temper. Or I should say I have a lack of control of my temper at times. I know where I got that. I inherited that by watching the way my father, I saw my father pick up a, a Honda 250 and throw it like 10 feet. Yeah, he was a big guy. And he was scary when he got mad. 
So I've learned that when I'm angry to give full vent to my anger. I learned that. Isaac has learned some things from his father. When time gets tough, just run. And, and you know, you can run in all sorts of different ways, right? You can run into a bottle. <laughs> you, can, you can jam a needle in yourself and run away. You can put the TV on and run away. You can run away into your job. You can run away and be obsessive about almost anything. Stamp collecting. You can get head over heels into something and it's just avoidance and you just run away. That's what he's doing. He's running just like his father did. Chip off the old block. Yes, that's what he is. He's a chip off the old block. And I didn't know if any of you understood that, but thank you, Brother Applegate, for bringing that to us. It was said by Winston Churchill, don't be content to be the chip off the old block. Be the old block itself. You know, with Christ, we have an opportunity to write a new page. You don't have to be a slave to how you were brought up. You don't have to be a slave to your temper, to your lust, to your avoidance of running away. You don't have to be a slave to any of that stuff. Amen? Amen. We can do what God would have us do and in a way that pleases God. Verse 2, and the Lord appeared to him and said, do not go down to Egypt, because that's where he was headed, just like his dad. Live in the land in which I will tell you. Dwell in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For you and your descendants, I will give these lands. I will perform an oath which I swore to Abraham, your father, and I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give to your descendants all these lands, and in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So Isaac dwelt in Gerar. Gerar was this place where his father had been previously. And if you remember, there was a guy named Abimelech who was in charge there. He, he's the son of the father. That's what his name is, Ab, Abby, meaning Abimelech. You're good. <laughs> and it's kind of a border town. It's on the way to Egypt. It's actually about halfway between Egypt and and Israel. So he's coming out of the center of the promised land and heading for Egypt. And the Lord says, stop, don't go to Egypt. It's not going to go well for you. Have you ever headed to a place of what you think will be comfort and a solution to the pressure that you're under? And the Lord say, stop. And sometimes it's like a speed bump and you keep going. But you can ruin your car if you go too fast over a speed bump, I know. So it's this border town. So he's kind of on the edge. The promise to Abraham is now passed down to Isaac. So there's no question. Isaac knows that God is with him and he's spoken to him. Don't go to Egypt though. And you know, the Lord will speak to us and tell us there are certain things we shouldn't do, right? Just like there are certain places we shouldn't go, certain things we shouldn't do. He'll warn our hearts before we get there. That's the benefit of the Holy Spirit. We get, we get this nuclear-powered conscience where God speaks to us and tells us those things. That's what it is to have a relationship with God, not just a religion where you practice, you know, standing up and sitting down and singing a song. And It's not all of that. It's about having a relationship, which takes care of a lot of other things. And so, Gerar means sojourn, by the way. You could call it the Red Roof Inn, if you will. Between the land of God that God promised to Abraham and his descendants. So he's kind of on the edge. So he's out of the center and he's kind of towards the edge. He was on his way to Egypt, I believe. That's why the Lord told him to stop. Um, and sometimes we get in a place and the Lord says, listen, just, just don't do anything right now. Don't make a decision right now. It's not a good time. It's not a good place for you. You ever had that happen? Yep. I've had that happen with the Lord. He just says, listen, just hold, hold tight. I've got something for you. And so God steps in and stops him at the border. Verse 7, and the men of the place of Gerar asked about his wife. Apparently, there are quite a batch there in Gerar. And he said, she is my sister. Yes, deja vu all over again. For he was afraid to say she is my wife because he thought, lest the men of the place kill me for Rebecca because she's beautiful to behold. So apparently... These guys, or I should say, the Lord knows how to pick these girls for these guys. Because Abraham 
had to go with Sarah there, and Sarah was beautiful, and he was worried about her getting picked up, and he goes, she's my sister, and that's exactly what happened. You remember, Abimelech took her into his house, and suddenly everybody was infertile, and they didn't have any sex drive anymore. It got, the Lord just wiped it out because he's trying to protect the seed that's going to come, who is Jesus the Christ, the son of the living God. And so he freezes everything, and they're like, I don't know what's going on. Things aren't working out. <laughs> Psalm 27.1 says this, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? It would have been good if he wrote this for Isaac. The Lord is my, the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Listen, that's like a roar right there. Who am I going to be afraid of? What are you going to do to me? You're twice as tall as me, you say you're going to kill me. Go ahead. You're just sending me home. God is the strength of my life. When you know that in your soul, there's nothing that will turn you upside down. It doesn't matter if we have a World War III. It doesn't matter what Putin's doing. It has no idea what, what's going on in Ukraine or the, the price of eggs. <laughs> People get all whacked out about these things. Listen, God's in control. He's still in the throne. Amen? Amen? And he's the strength of our lives. And we can depend upon him. He's always dependable. I'm reminded of Ephesians chapter 3. Uh, chapter 5, sorry, 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. You see, his basic problem was he was afraid. He was insecure. And so he lied. And he wasn't willing to die for his wife. Men, has there been a time when you don't want to die for your wife? You don't want to lay your life down for her? That's what he's saying. I'd, I, I didn't want to die because of her. Well, that's what he calls us to do as men, isn't it? Husbands, love your wife in the same way that Christ Jesus loved the church and he died. Men, that's what we do. That's why we go into war, right? That's why they give us weapons and we go into the military because we die. That's what we do. And you do that in your marriage too. If you're not doing that, then you're not doing what God's called you to do. He's trying to find a back door. Isaac is sneaking out. Verse 8, and it came to pass when he had been there a long time. By the way, a place of sojourn is not a place you want to be for a long time. The Red Roof Inn, not a place you want to live. You just pass through, right? I know they make your bed. I mean, I know, and, that's, and they vacuum your floors and all that. I know that. You don't want to live there, though, do you? Some of you look like you're in doubt. Okay. When he had been there a long time that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked through his window and he saw there was Isaac showing endearment to Rebekah, his wife. The King James says, saw him sporting. Not with a Frisbee. <laughs> then Abimelech called Isaac and said, quite obviously she is your wife. So how could you say that she is my sister? He got caught in his lie, just like his father. Isaac said to him, because I said, lest I die on account of her. Well, why is that such a bad thing? Aren't you supposed to do that as a husband anyway? And Abimelech said, what is this that you've done to us? One of the people might have lain with your wife and you would have brought guilt on us. He says, listen, anybody could just walk up and have sex with her and that'd be it. And it'd be, then we're in trouble. I think you're already in trouble. If you've got guys carousing and think they could just grab somebody and have sex with them, I think you've got a bigger problem. Anyway. They would have very casually, might have soon, that's what it means. It means casually just have uh, laid with your wife like she would have been a willing participant, right? And you would have brought guilt upon us. And so Abimelech charged all of his people saying, he who touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Sorry, I, I lied. You ever get stuck in a lie? You ever get caught in a lie? That is terrible. That is a terribly dirty way to feel. I remember when I was a kid, we, we used to, you know, fill out a test or whatever, and then we'd pass all the papers up front. You know, you'd grab the people. And I had A students behind me. So what I, I did is I took a paper and I wrote my name on it. I handed it in. It was the first A I ever got. 
but I wasn't very smart because my handwriting looked nothing like the A student. <laughs> and I got caught. And the teacher called me up in front of the class and had me stand in front of everyone as she grilled me. I, I think I was, I think it was first grade. I think I was six years old. And I was humiliated. I felt my face burning. You know, when you're embarrassed. And she goes, is this your paper? I said, yes. <laughs> Unconvincingly. And of course, the guy behind me never trusted me ever again. And I always got the look. It's a terrible thing to be caught in a lie. I mean, it's, it's hard enough. It's hard enough to hear difficult things from a friend, but... Being rebuked and corrected is hard enough when you take it from a loving friend, but no less from a pagan king. Now, here's, here's Isaac, who's supposed to have a relationship with God. God talks to him, tells him what to do, where to go, where not to go. And he's got some pagan king who's more righteous than he is, telling him, what did you do? What are you, out of your mind? You lied to us. That's going to bring guilt on us. God's going to take vengeance. How did Abimelech know? Because his father's name was Abimelech, the same guy that had to deal with Abraham. And so uh, that song comes to mind, Teach Your Children Well. It's in my head. Your children well. Sorry, never mind. <laughs> you want to teach your kids the mistakes that you do that they shouldn't make, right? I, I've had some parents tell me, you know, you didn't tell your kids about your whole background, did you? Oh, yeah, I did. You did? Yeah, I told them what a dirtbag I was. Well, don't they just go out and decide that they're going to do, you know, do drugs and, and criminal behavior because you did? No. I tell them all the horrible, terrible things about it and the side effects of it. And then they go, wow, dad, you really did that? I say, yeah. And then there's like, I'll do anything you tell me from now on. I'll be obedient. I'll be good. It should have an impact on your kids when you share your faults. Apparently, someone learned and somebody didn't in this story. Verse 12, then Isaac sowed in that land and reaped that same year a hundredfold. By the way, that's like getting, that's like getting a gigantic raise. And the Lord blessed him. And the man began to prosper and continued prospering until he became very prosperous. And he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and great number of servants so the Philistines envied him. It's kind of like being on the job and having been there a million years and some new guy pops up and suddenly he's elevated to a place that, I mean, way beyond you. Have you ever had that happen? It happens. I've had it happen. I, I, anyway, you guys are just paying very careful attention today. I appreciate that. So Isaac sows in the land. He's got this hundredfold thing. Take note, God blesses Isaac after his sin is exposed and confessed. After the secret lie about his sister slash wife, who wasn't anything like his sister, actually he was a cousin, if anything. After that's uncovered and he confesses, that's when God blesses him. And you know what? I find that to be a principle in our lives, don't you? If you've got a secret and you're hiding it, it's like all progress, all forward progress spiritually kind of stops until you get over that hurdle. But as soon as he did, and it all was seen, and I'm sure the Lord directed Abimelech to look out that window that day and see him sporting with his wife. And so suddenly, he's a, he's a big man, and he's a stranger, okay? So he's from far away. He's, he's a Hebrew, a descendant of Abraham. He's not from there. He's just passing through. But he is being blessed by God, and everybody around sees it. And what happens when somebody's being blessed and you feel like you're not, envy, envy. Yeah, you ever see that? The difference between jealousy and envy, jealousy is desiring to have something that is yours, that's rightfully yours, but isn't in your possession right now. So somebody steals my car, I'm jealous. I'm not envious, but I'm envious when I desire something that isn't mine. So there's a difference between jealousy... You know, jealousy is something God is. It says that God is jealous. His name is jealous. So is it a sin to be jealous? Wow. The crowd went wild. Listen, 
There is a righteous jealousy. If somebody's sleeping with my wife, I am jealous. I am righteously jealous. That's not wrong. Envy is another thing. That means God doesn't take care of me. I don't have enough stuff. How many of you don't have enough stuff? I got some. I'll give it to you. I'll give it to you, brother. What do you need? I'm sure I have at least one of everything I can afford to be without. If you want to avoid others being envious, what do you do? If God has prospered you and given you lots of great things, and, he, and, and it's God who's done it, how do you prevent people from being envious? You could give it away. You could share it. Right? But the first thing you should do, don't act the way that declares your unworthiness of it. Don't be a liar. <laughs> don't be a cheat. Don't be somebody who doesn't give glory to God for it. Don't be a non-thankful person. There are lots of things that you can do to dissuade people from being envious of you. You know, somebody, you know, somebody comes to me and says, oh, Dave, I really, really like that car of yours. How long you had that? Well, it was a gift from my son. A gift from your, your son gave you the car? My son gave me that car. Can I boast of that? I can't boast of it because it was a gift. I didn't even pay for it. I mean, I've been paying for it ever since, but I, it's a good car and I haven't had to dump a ton of money into it. Praise God. You can give God the glory and it's really hard for people to be envious of you at that point because they're problems with God, not with you. Verse 15, now the Philistines had stopped up all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham, his father, and they had filled them with earth. If you remember, Abimelech and Abraham had a deal. I'm going to be good to you. You'll be good to me. Everything's good, right? Right. Listen, I've done nothing but good to you, Abraham. So we're going to have a good relationship, right? We're not going to mess with each other. He goes, oh yeah, by the way, your servants have come and commandeered my wells. He goes, you're kidding me. Well, they're going to give them back. That's the way it is. And so that's the way it was. But as soon as Abraham died, they filled the wells in. You don't own this property. Abraham died. I don't care what's in the will. And they stopped them up. Don't you find that amazing? They don't just use them. I mean, it's a lot of construction. Big, d digging a big hole in the ground in an arid area on the edge of the Negev, which is the desert. Don't you think they'd want it? No, that's just plain old spiteful. And what it is, is they're trying to take that property away that you don't own it. You don't have a right to it. And so they filled in all of those things. And Abimelech said to Isaac, go away from us for you are much mightier than we. It's a problem when you get blessed. People aren't comfortable with you anymore. And then Isaac departed from there and he pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and he dwelt there. So he went away from the people. And Isaac dug again the wells of water in which they had dug in the days of Abraham his father for the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. He called them by their names which his father had called them. Also, Isaac's servant dug in the valley and found a well of running water there. Actually, the, the original Hebrew says, found a well of living water there. That has certain connotations for the New Testament, doesn't it? When Jesus speaks of himself as that living water, when he speaks to the good, he speaks to the Samaritan woman by the well. It's interesting. He says, if you knew who it was who asked you for a drink, you'd ask him and he'd give you living water. And she said, sir, give me this water from now on so that I don't have to keep coming to this well. Anyway, <clears throat> Proverbs 23 says this, do not remove an ancient landmark. And I know some of you are saying, okay. <laughs> Any of you been following this re recent murder thing with Murdoch? Yeah. Oh, any of you have a phone, yes. Okay. <laughs> it's interesting. Did they have any solid proof? And so we've just moved an ancient landmark. You might say, well, a guy probably did it, so we need to prove. Yeah, well, you know what? You're innocent until proven guilty, but they didn't prove it. But everybody said he's guilty, and now he's got a lifetime prison uh, sentence. Somebody moved a marker. Somebody set a precedent. You can now be accused of something without any proof. Because he did. There are people that move those ancient landmarks. And it doesn't bode well for us because then the government has ultimate power to do whatever they want. 
I'm not trying to scare you. Think about it. Anyway, the rest of Proverbs 23, verse says, nor enter the fields of the fatherless, I'm trying to take advantage of somebody who can't defend themselves, for their redeemer is mighty, meaning God. He will plead their cause against you. Apply your heart to instruction and your ears to words of knowledge. Do not withhold correction from a child. For if you beat him with a rod, he will not die. You shall beat him with a rod. By the way, that's, that's a command. You shall beat him with a rod and deliver his soul from hell. When you punish a child, you're showing them that their disobedience means pain. And a, a child on the smallest level will understand pain. If you say, I'm taking away your Nintendo, they'd be like, so? You say, go to your room. That's where I wanted to go anyway. <laughs> Spanking your kids is a biblical thing. And if any of you want to argue with the scriptures, you can go right ahead. But that's what it says. Anyway, don't remove an ancient landmark. Don't change the laws. Don't enter the fields of the fathers. Don't try to take advantage of people by moving in on a place where God doesn't want you to move in. But these guys filled the wells and they basically took over that property. But the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's servant, uh, herdsmen saying, the water is ours. Because they redug the things that they filled in, they wanted to come and take possession. So he called the name of the well Esek because they quarreled with him. That means quarrel. And then they dug another well and they quarreled over that one also. And so he called its name Sitna. It's funny, there seems to be water everywhere, but there's none that you can drink. Uh, that, that's a quote, if any of you went to college, anyway, uh, from the ancient mariner. Anyway, so he moved from there and he dug another well. And they did not quarrel over it. And so he called his name Rehoboth because he said, for now the Lord has made room for us. We shall be fruitful in the land. And you say, so what? Well, that's what I say. He dug one well and he called it quarrel. <laughs> he dug another one and he called it enmity or, or opposition or adversary. And then he dug a third one and apparently they were already stretched out and there was enough room that he was away from them. And he goes, okay, I'm going to name this a good one. We're going to call it Rehoboth, which means spacious. And it's actually there to this day. Spacious. The Lord has finally given us a place to stay. Have you ever had this situation? You know, you try, you settle somewhere, you work hard, you dump your life in like you're digging a well and it's digging a well that should have been open already, but it wasn't. And as soon as you get it finished, somebody else comes and takes possession of it. All right, well, I'll dig another well until so you dig a second well. And so you dig this well and then they come alongside and say, no, 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 that's not yours, that's ours, you can't have it. All right, well, I'm going to call you a bad name. <laughs> I'm going to call you Essek. So he names them bad names, and then he finally digs a third well, and he calls it Rehoboth, which means God's made room for us. It's spacious. Have you ever had a situation where you're trying to seek what God would have you do, and you get into a situation and dump your life into it, and then it's gone? Or you get a job and you pour it. You know, I, I remember jobs I've had. I've had a string of them uh, before I got here. And I, I remember pouring my life into fixing everything, organizing the files and getting everything squared away, you know, even vacuuming out my company car and you get it all beautiful, ni nice and shiny and you start making some money. You start getting customers. You start, things begin to roll and the business is picking up and they suddenly take your territory and cut it in half because you're making too much money. And so... You grow and you grow and you pour out and you pour out and it begins to grow again. And then they say, you still have too much money. I'm cutting it in half again. I've had that happen. None of you ever had anything like that happen, ever. How about having a child that you pour your life into and it seems like they've wasted it? Mm -hmm. How about a neighbor that you show love to and then they uh, get twisted up about something small and they don't talk to you anymore? What about one of those kind of wells where you pour yourself out for somebody in effort and energy and love and suddenly it's a dead end? That can be a very disappointing thing. And so here's Isaac digging wells and he finally digs one and he goes, good, we're home. 
found a place where I can dwell. This must be where God would have us be. Let's name it spaciousness. So you know what? If you dig a well and they take it, dig another one. And if they take it, keep digging. Dig another one. And that's what he does. He just keeps going. That's an encouragement for me. Sometimes you might think you're wasting your life and you're wasting your time and you're pouring out all your efforts and it seems like a fruitless task. But God will give fruit when he chooses. So don't stop digging. Don't stop praying. Don't stop talking. Don't stop showing love towards those family members. Okay? But the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled. Oh, no. Did you know it takes 53 gallons of water to get one glass of milk? It takes 53. This is how important water is in these areas. I got this from an Africa Inland Mission uh, website. It takes 53 gallons of water. I had to convert it from liters. I hope you appreciate. Mm -hmm. That's actually 200 liters. I had to do the, the math and everything. It takes 53 gallons of water for one glass of milk. So, you know, like there, there are these agents th that say, if you send us money, we'll give a goat to a, 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 well, they better have water or else it'll just be one meal you're getting them because that goat will just become dinner and that'll be the end. But it takes 53 gallons of water for one glass of milk and it takes 1,561 gallons of water to get one pound of beef. Makes you appreciate the steak you're going to have later. Yeah. This is how important water is to people that, are, that have animals. And it's important for us as well. And then he went up to Beersheba and the Lord appeared to him the same night. Now, I don't know about you, but I thought he just, I thought he just made a home. He just dug a well where he's got no trouble, he's got no quarrels, and it seems like it's safe and everything's fine, and he leaves. Don't you find that unusual? He went up from there to Beersheba and the Lord appeared to him that same night and said, I am the Lord. I am, I am the God of your father, Abraham. Do not fear for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for my servant Abraham's sake. He's just repeating that God is with him and he's going to bless him. So he built an altar there and he called on the name of the Lord and he pitched his tent there and there Isaac's servants dug a well. You're no kidding. That's all they do is they dig wells. Dig a well here, dig a well there, dig a well there. He finally found a place where everything was fine and he left there. Why? Why would you leave a perfectly good well that you just dumped all your life into? Now he's not getting pushed out. He just electively leaves. Whenever I see a little mystery in the scriptures like that and I go, hmm, it makes me look a little bit deeper. And so this is actually the well in Beersheba, and you can go and visit it. Like I said, it's, it's on the edge of the desert, so you have to like dry places and make sure you bring water with you because this is now a historic site, so they don't, uh, they don't let you go digging in there and getting water out of it. But they dig a well, and he builds an altar. We've never seen Isaac build an altar yet. And God comes and speaks to him personally. We see him saying, don't go to Egypt. That's kind of a negative uh, connotation. God shows up and says, don't do it. That's different. Now he shows up and he's speaking with blessing. Now he's going to bless him. But he builds an altar. I think that's rather interesting, don't you? He builds an altar. That's significant. So he builds an altar. He's actually worshiping God. And we don't see him doing this earlier. And he plants himself and he digs a well. This is a place he settles in. Well, what's the difference between this and Rehoboth? He dug the well and everything seemed to be fine. Why did he leave that well? I'm not going to answer. There you go. Then Abimelech came, for him, came to him from Gerar with Ahuzath, one of the friends of Phicol. If you remember Phicol, he, that's a position actually like Abimelech is. He's his general, the commander of his army. And Isaac said to him, why have you come to me since you hate me and you have sent me away? <laughs> Sounds a little needy. <laughs> but they said, we have certainly seen that the Lord is with you. And so he said, let me now 
be an oath between us, being you, uh, between you and us. And let us make a covenant with you that you will do us no harm since we have not touched you and since we have done nothing but good and have sent you away in peace. Well, that's not exactly the truth, but you are now the blessed of the Lord. So he sees Isaac is being blessed like Abraham was. And so he made with them a feast and they ate and they drank and they arose early in the morning and swore an oath to one another and Isaac sent them away and they departed from him in peace. His enemies, the guys that said, you need to get the heck out of Dodge. We, we don't want you here. There's way more of you than there are of us. And we're getting a little nervous. And so he leaves and he digs wells and the guys follow him. And everywhere he goes, they take over the wells until he builds Rehoboth. And then he leaves voluntarily. And then suddenly his enemy shows up and wants to make peace. Don't you find that suspicious? Why did it take all of this time? Why did it take this well in this place? Why? In Romans chapter 12, verses 18 to 21, it says, if it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. I like that scripture. Because there are some people you can't possibly live at peace with. Do all you can, as far as it lies within you, live at peace with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place for God's wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. And in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. It's interesting, Isaac, a man of peace, didn't go running to Abimelech and saying, your guys are taking my wells. He didn't do that. The second well, he didn't say, your guys are taking my other well. Like he didn't do that because he was interested in peace. And so he just moved on. He took the hit and he moved on. I think that's a good characteristic of a man right there. I think it's a good Christ-like quality to value peace instead of fighting when well, you could fight. But what are you going to end up with when you're done? You got a well, but everybody hates you. Welcome to the neighborhood. <laughs> so he let it go, and he let it go until he found a place, and yet he didn't stay there. Interesting. In Proverbs 16, verse 7 says, When a man's way pleases the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. I like that scripture, don't you? When you're at peace with God, he even makes your enemies to have peace with you. When you're doing what's right before God. When you don't do what's right before God, you don't have that promise. It's a conditional thing. So it came to pass on the same day that Isaac's servants came to him and told him about the well in which they had dug and said to him, we have found water. And so he called it Sheba. And therefore the name of that city is Beersheba to the day. Beersheba, beer means well. We know what it means here in America, but it means a well. The well of Sheba or the well of the oath or the well of seven. It's, a, it's the very same well that uh, Abraham was involved. Do you think it's a coincidence that he just happened to find water that day as he was saying goodbye to his guests and Abimelech and his boys were on their way out and they found water? God blessed him by able to, being able to find water by being far enough away and yet his enemy came to make peace with him. This is all God's activity, isn't it? This is all happening behind the scenes. God's making this happen, and he can do it again. Beersheba means well of the oath or the well of seven. It's kind of a play on words in the Hebrew. I won't uh, bore you with all of that. And so guess what? Now it seems like they're really home. I mean, what's the difference between Rehoboth and Beersheba? You might know. Esau was 40 years old. He took his wives, Judith, the daughter of Beri, the Hittite, and Basemath, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. And they were a grief of mind to Isaac and Rebekah. Boy, you guys are very quiet. <laughs> you know what it's like when you have new members of your family and you're like, oi. Well, then you know how it was for Isaac and his wife. He takes two women, apparently the same time when he's 40 years old. So it was within the same year or maybe it was the same ceremony. 
He's got two. Ladies, how many of you, I wonder, would be content to live with a man who had another wife? And number two, they're Hittites. These are idol-worshiping women. These, these aren't, you know, bell of the ball types. And so you have two very different people. You have Jacob, who had his wife purchased actually for him, and he brought her in from a good, righteous family. And here's, here's some others that are not so much. And they're a grief to Isaac and Rebekah. Like, I'm so sorry that Esau has married these women because they make our life misery. I can, I, 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 my heart goes out. I understand what that's like. I mean, I can imagine what it's like. I don't have that myself, praise God. So is this a rebellious move on behalf of Esau or is it just a typical fleshly man? I don't know. It doesn't tell us the motives of, of what he did, but I often find children will do things just to tick off their parents. <laughs> Notice that? Oh, my parents are going to love this. <laughs> I just graduated high school. They want me to go to college, but I, I met a guy named Bruno who's 47 years old and drives a Harley Davidson. <laughs> the names have been changed to protect the innocent, but that happens. <laughs> so do you think he was just being rebellious or you think he's just acting out of his fleshly, you know, he's just being Esau? Hey, you look good. Why don't you move in with me? <laughs> happens all day long. Anyway, so I picture it like this. You know, you, you got the guy with the Harley and he's got two wives. Anyway, so let me see if I can figure out how to use my thumb. In Romans 15, 4, it says, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. So I believe even looking at the years of Isaac's life and his sojourning and the digging of wells and, and coming to Rehoboth and finding a place and then going to another place, I believe all of that is there for our learning. And sometimes I go through a chapter and I'm like, what am I going to tell these people? You should try it sometime. You guys are intimidating. So what system of guidance do you follow? Do you look for the milk and honey land to avoid hardship, like running away from a difficult situation when, you, when there's a famine? Do you go and try to find an easier place to exist? Circumstance and the path of least resistance, is that how you determine what God would have you do? Like circumstances, you know, if Murphy gets elected, I'm out of here. And if Trump's elected, I'm definitely leaving the country. I mean, do you use circumstance to dictate where you're going to go? And, and, and shouldn't the people of God have a different way? Why is it circumstance? We think, oh, well, you know, God wouldn't have let Murphy be our governor if, if he wanted me to live in this state. That's some twisted logic. Because there's a whole bunch of other people that are staying. Is it, I need to go to the path of least resistance? I need to go where it's easy? I, I need to get out of here because there's a famine? And I'll tell you what, living in New Jersey is not easy. I, I, I look at my paycheck and go, who's FICA? <laughs> I look at my mortgage and I go, I have to have insurance on this place. And they make me pay every year. And, the, and the, it just goes up and up and up and up. And nobody could tell them, hey, that's enough. You can make enough money, you insurance companies. I guess I'm just complaining. Do you just let circumstance, so you just go with the flow, this passive sort of, you know, whatever happens, I'm going to trust that God's going to move me by circumstance? Or is God more purposeful than that? Didn't he step up and tell Isaac, stop right there? I got to know right now. <laughs> Do you plan on going to Egypt? Much more direct. Find out where God makes his manifest presence known. Worship him, set up camp, and then dig a well. He may even give you peace with your enemies. 
Find out where God is. Get on board with what God is doing. Don't just go digging wells because you'll waste your life digging wells. Well, I got to find one where I can get water. Trust me, the Lord will bless you. You'll find water anywhere. Did with him. Rehoboth was nice, but it wasn't where the Lord would want him to be. He ended up going to Beersheba and that's where the Lord wanted him to be. And that's where the Lord met him and spoke to him. And he made an altar. Notice the order. <laughs> His manifest presence was known. He set up an altar. Hey guys, there are a lot of people who say, I'm going to move because I don't like New Jersey. Well, amen. I'll pray for you. I've known people to move and they're paying a little bit less money out of their pocket, but they can't find a church. I know a family went to 17 different churches and they're still not happy because this altar right here, you don't get this everywhere. Find out what God's up to. Find out where God's presence is. Then you set up camp. Then you dig a well. Don't worry about the well first because that was his problem. Everywhere a well, a well, a well. God wants you somewhere else and his presence will be there. And when God's presence is there, that's a place you want to dig a well and the Lord will bless you and he might even cause your enemies to be at peace with you. Like Phil Murphy. Anyway. In Job 42 verses five and six, the ultimate expression of why Job went through everything he went through I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear. He's speaking to God. But now my eye sees you. Therefore, I abhor myself and I repent in dust and ashes. Everything that Job went through, all of the money that he had, all the cattle he had, all the family he had, and he lost it all. And the Lord allowed it to be lost. And then his own health he lost, which if we live long enough, that may end up happening to all of us. And at the end, he said, I get it. All of this is so that I might have a relationship instead of a religion. Because I heard about you with the ear. I, I, I heard about you as being God, but now I see you face to face. That is the entire benefit of what Job went through. And I think that's the entire benefit of what Isaac went through with all of these dealings in Gerar and with the wells. He finally gets to a place where, okay, Lord, I have a relationship with you, and that's more important. And I'm going to go where there's a relationship, and then I'm going to set up my tent, and I'm going to dig a well, and I'm going to stay there. Because I'll tell you what, if you leave that, you will not be satisfied anywhere else. And so next week, we're going to look at stealing God's favor. Yes, I worded that exactly the way I wished to. Stealing God's blessing, stealing God's favor. It's a messed up situation. You think you got a weird family. We got some dysfunctional family stuff we're coming into. So tune in next week. 